So acids and bases, first of all, are very difficult to understand. Um, and so if you, if you feel confident in them, perhaps reconsider. Um, the, the typical way that acids and bases are taught, starting at an early age, is that they're taught through pH. And the, and the thinking is that if you have a pH of 7, that you're neutral. If you're above 7, you're basic. If you're below 7, you're acidic. Some people will put scales on those. Okay, and I've seen all kinds of stuff from 1 to 7 to 0 to 7. There's no limit. You can have acids that have negative pHs. There are some super acids that have pHs of like negative 31, I think. Um, and, and likewise, there's, there's not a, I mean, I guess there are limits, but they're not 0 or 14. Uh, bases can go beyond 14. Um, and so I don't think that pH is a very good starting point for acids and bases, especially because we don't really, we don't really know what pH is. Uh, and so you're really kind of building a foundation on, on sand, so to speak. And then in addition to that, the pH obscures the fact that neither of these things exist in isolation. So you can't have an acid. Okay, there's no such thing as just having an acid. There's no such thing as just having a base. You always have an acid and a base together. An acid is not an acid until a base comes along. Okay, you can have hydrochloric acid and it's not an acid unless something comes along that can, that can undergo an acidic basic reaction. And so we really should kind of define these in a little bit better fashion in terms of verbiage. You know, it's a, it's a process. Uh, an acid and a base undergo an acidic base, acid base reaction rather than saying this thing's an acid or this thing's a base. We can tell which things are likely to be acids or likely to be bases, um, but until we put another chemical with them, that's really not a great way to start by, by kind of saying that these things exist. Now, to understand how an acid and base work, what you first want to understand is why would things stick together? Why do things bond? Okay. So if we look at a very, very simple molecule, which is H2, we have a hydrogen bonded to a hydrogen. Okay. Well, a hydrogen atom typically is just a proton, so let's put a little plus here, and, and the other one is a proton, and they both have electrons. Now, why would those two protons stick together? Well, because the negative charge goes in between them and spends more time in between these two protons. So this is attracted to this, is attracted to that. Let's kind of put that there. So there's an attractive force between the protons and electrons. And there's also some repulsion. Okay, so there's repulsion here, and there's repulsion here. And the sum of all of those forces can add up to a force that draws these two close until it goes to zero. And at that point, if you get a little bit closer, it'll start to push them apart. Uh, but we can, we can understand why these would stick together kind of based on how far apart things are and things like that. As, as these become further apart, their forces of attraction or repulsion get smaller. So, so I think just by taking that simple approach, uh, then we can see why those would stick together. But now the question is, well, what if you took hydrogen and bonded it to something that's very electronegative, some kind of halogen, let's say. Okay, well, what's going to be different about this? So now we have our proton. And we have our two electrons, um, and let's just let's just keep this as x. So x here would be some large number of protons with some electrons in there. And and now what's going to happen is the electrons are going to spend more time by the x than they are with the hydrogen. Okay, it's going to be an unequal sharing of the bond. And I'm drawing them shifted over here. Really, they're moving all over the place, and, and over time we would find them more frequently over here than we would over here. So I'm I'm kind of modeling this, so to speak. What's this getting out of this then? Well, not as much as before. Here, we have a very strong interaction between these electrons. Here, we have some interaction, but we also have some, a lot more repulsion in order for that to move any close to those electrons. And so that, that hydrogen there really is not, it's not bonded very well to this. Okay? This is a specific interaction that, that we usually start with just hydrogen, but we can expand it to further things with Lewis adds as a basis. This hydrogen, then, is easy to remove if I can bring something else along that has a negative charge. So if I bring another negative charge, then my net attractive force this way can be overpowered by that. It can be pulled that way. And the motion of that proton from one thing that, to the other, the motion of that hydrogen plus one ion, is what acid-base reactions are all about. Okay. Now, the destination of that proton is your base. The thing that's being departed from, okay, that's your acid. Okay, and you can also define the acid maybe as the H plus itself. 
But, but the key idea here is that there is a motion of this charged particle, of this proton, and that's what an acid-base reaction is. Redox reactions, we look at electrons moving around. In precipitation reactions, we look at ions moving around. Here we look at a specific ion, proton, okay, H plus one. So, so, so knowing that that's what an acid base is, sets you up to then go through and look at other things like weak acids and strong acids. Okay, a weak acid has a stronger bond here, so it's much more difficult for it to undergo its acidic duty, so to speak, of giving away that proton. The strong acid has a really weak interaction here, and so therefore this, the strong acid can, can easily give away that H+. A strong base can do its job properly, it can take away an H+. A weak base cannot do a take, take away an H+, very well. If we mix a weak acid and a weak base, we're going to get some motion of that H+. And we can kind of make a list up of how strong and weak things are relative to one another. Um, when we get into pH, pH we now can define a little better because we've kind of set up a situation where it's clear that you always have one of each. Now, if I tell you that I have a solution, and I say the pH of that solution is 10, what you want to be able to gather from that, what the stronger understanding of acids and bases is, is that you put, okay, you put some form of base, but that you mixed it with water, okay, or some other solvent, but, but probably water. And this is acting as your base, and this is acting as your acid. Okay, so implicit in pH is that there's a presence of a solvent, usually water, that acts in conjunction with the other chemical you've added to it. And therefore, we can still see that both of these things are present, and, and that allows us to maintain a, a better definition of things. Okay, and then we can go through and look at the math behind this, and other things such as that. But now we have a better understanding of, of, okay, so this is my really weak acid in this case, and this is my strong base, or, or weak base since it's pH of 10. Uh, and therefore, we can go ahead and look at that in a little better understanding. Okay. So we're looking at a base, pH of 10. Let's actually draw a container here. So here's, here's some water. Now some background information that you want to know prior to pH is, is that water itself is not just water. You may have 100% pure water, which is very difficult to isolate it from, from air or other gases. But even if you have 100% pure, it's not going to be 100% pure because water will always react with itself. And every once in a while, when two water molecules bump into each other, uh, an H plus will transfer from one to the other. And that's a very small, temporary thing. We don't get a lot of these, okay? but we always have some. When you start to add something to this, so if we go ahead and we take a base, something that can take away an H plus, and we dump it in the water, that's going to cause a shift in the amounts of these. Okay. Now, at normal concentrations, at regular temperature, in perfectly distilled water with nothing else dissolved in it, uh, and no, nothing suspended in it, um, we would have 10 to the minus 7 concentrations of molarity for each of these. And that's where the pH of 7 comes from, is from that exponent right there. Um, and, and when I add a base to this, what's then going to happen is some of the water molecules that are in here are going to, let's draw this a little bit better, some of the water molecules are going to have an H plus taken away and it's going to bond to that base. Okay, so if we add a base plus water, then what we're going to do is we're going to turn this into BH plus, whatever this is, and that'll give us a hydroxide ion. Now, that hydroxide increase is going to cause this amount to go up, and this amount then is going to go down because of, of more collisions with these. It's going to turn these back into water. Uh, the product of those two amounts, though, will stay constant. So if this goes up to 10 to the minus 2, this is going to be 10 to the minus 12. Okay? And, and that scale that this follows works out really nicely for the pH. We put it in a logarithmic thing. If my pH, if my OH minus goes up to um, 10 to the minus 2, like we said earlier, and this becomes 10 to the minus 12, my pH will then be 12 which we could go back from, you know, second or third grade and recognize that as being basic, okay? So looking at the action of, of this motion of the H+, plus, I think is very critical for having a good understanding of what's happening in acids and bases. 
when you start with things like pH, or even sometimes the definitions if you really don't understand it, uh, I know a lot of times we can look at, oh, this thing's getting an H+, but to break it down through bonding, I think is the starting point for understanding acids and bases. And if you didn't start out with it, that's okay. You probably have bits and pieces, but they probably don't holistically make sense. But when you get this concept of this thing moving from one thing to the other as an acid-base reaction, that's the point that kind of starts to set up everything else to be understood. Okay, and that's a very critical thing. Now, for some of you who are taking a higher level class, you're then going to go one step beyond that, and you're going to get rid of the H+. Okay, you're going to go from Bronson and Lowry to, to Lewis, and then in that case, you're just looking at the electronic interaction. But it's the same idea. It no longer has to be an H+, here. It just has to be something that will form a cordon covalent bond with a pair of electrons on something else. Okay? And so I think that that, that bonding structure component of, of acids and bases is really something that when that's missing, everything else will seem a little bit gibberishy. And once that's there, then you can go back and start to go through even equilibrium and weak acids and KAs and KBs, and those calculations then should start to make more sense.